<laughs> nice. That's nice. We will be bringing some special music. Uh, you bring your music and we'll bring ours and we'll do it together. The people that do it with me everywhere we go uh, are adding a group from Chile. Sergio Leva, who now is uh, half time with us with our crusades around the world, he'll be here. Uh, he said, he's from Chile. He said, Pastor Dan, can I bring a group? His mother is a music chair at our university down there, and they put a group together. He's down there practicing with them right now. So I think you will have some world-class music. And uh, some of our people that are close by will come and join. And my dear brother, you sing too. Uh, that's nice. How are you today? Happy New Year. Happy Sabbath to you all. Uh, as we get older, we are... Uh, Talking about a bucket list. You know what a bucket list is? You know what you want to do before you kick the bucket. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, we, we know that that window of whatever time we have left together is getting smaller. We better, so we sit down sometimes and just say, okay, what what we want to do? So we did Iceland. Iceland's amazing. Some of our friends were in Iceland. They sent me pictures of all the northern lights. They got it on the second night. They had everything, colors, white, red, green. Sent me all the pictures this week. But they were colder than we were. They were down in the zero plus, down below. We were at 32, 33 every time. But we got to see this, and we got to see the best waterfalls in the world. So bucket list. So we have Machu Picchu on our list. We're going to do Norway this year. My, I'm a Venden. If you know the Venden name in the Adventist church, they're mostly all uh, past now, but my two cousins that are preaching around the country. So we're Vendens, and there's a Venden farm. So everybody has to go at least once in their life and go see the Venden farm. So we're going to try to go this year, August. Bucket list. I want to go to the Great Barrier Reef. I want to scuba dive the Maldive Islands. There's some places I want to dive before I'm too old to dive anymore. So I'm a scuba diver. What I want to talk about today is more important to me and gives me more pleasure than anything else on my bucket list. I'm just going to give you part of my own story here today. I was pastoring in Chicago, a place called Hinsdale. They actually called me back last year to go back and pastor my old church 30 years later for 10 weeks. There was some war going on and they wanted to just bring in an old pastor, so they chose me. Wonderful time. Some, some problems, but, oh, it was nice to see everybody and visit everybody. Stayed in a little hotel room for 10 weeks. So I was 40 years old. One Friday night, I was at a Friday night free. Didn't have to preach the next day. So I turned on the radio to listen to Bill Hybels speak for the Founders Week uh, program they had at Moody Bible Christian College in Chicago. He had just come over from India, and he wrote this sermon on the plane. And he began to talk about impact players. He said, coaches are going all over the country every night. They're at high schools and colleges trying to find the next impact player. It's easy enough to find the other guys who are the rest of the team and the, the bench players and all. You can find plenty of those. What's hard to find are the impact players, the Michael Jordans, the Magics, Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, there's more today, Kobe. We landed from India just before the virus started. We are all landed at LAX, and all of us, we had, what, 10 of us maybe, all of our phones lit up. Did you hear? Kobe passed away. Impact player. Not just on basketball. He began to make movies and began to have other ways that he was going to be an impact player, then it was all gone. These players are not afraid. They are not afraid to have the ball at the end of the game. They refuse to lose. They will carry the team on their back and just say, We're, we are going to get this. Impact. Impact player. And Bill Hybels said you're not just impact players for sports, but impact players in life. There are the 
the Mother Teresa's. I've been to Mother Teresa's house a couple times now in Calcutta. Great place. You just feel the atmosphere. The first time I went, there were people there who had worked with her that I got to talk to. Her grave is there. You go up to her room. Here's her, her little bed, two little saris. She started as a little tiny uh, teacher from, uh, what, Armenia somewhere? She had to write a letter to the Pope to get out of her order so that she could go out and do what she wanted and serve the poor. She rode the bus out to the slums and had no money to ride the bus back, had to walk. And she started with a stick teaching these poor kids the alphabet in the mud under a tree. By the time she died, there were 497 Mother Teresa houses all over the world. Isn't that? Everybody knows the name Mother Teresa. Gandhi, been to his grave a few times in New Delhi, some other places, watched some movies, powerful movie. Started in South Africa, then came to India, and just could not accept the way it was. There's no reason why the British should still be here. He said, it's time for you to go. Changed that country. Now a billion some people set them free without violence. Gandhi. I just talked about this in the Philippines, so I included this. Dr. Rizal is the one, just a genius, doctor and lawyer and writer and philosopher and poet. I've been to his house where he was in kind of a prison in his house, house arrest. Just couldn't accept that the Philippines were still under the Spanish. Eventually got freedom. People who cannot accept the world the way it is and said, we're going to have an impact, we're going to change it. And Bill Hybels that night in front of that Founders Week with a thousand students there, me listening on the radio said, God is looking for impact players. Easy enough for God to find the people who will fill out the bench in the pew. Stand, go to church, stand up, sit down, pay a little money. You know, bring some food to the potluck maybe. Where to find impact players who will just go out there and build the kingdom of God. He said, God is looking for impact players. I was 40 years old. Knelt down in my little office downstairs there in Chicago, Hinsdale, and said, God, I, whatever, I, I'll do the best I can. If you'll use me and bless me, but I would like to be an impact player for you. Everything that has happened in my life from there till now is because of that night, that decision. I uh, wish it was more, wish I'd had more of an impact, still do. But every baptism, every crusade, every church we've built, whatever else, is because of that, that night. I'm 69 now, and uh, I don't know how many more crusades I get to do around the world. We have, I think, six this year, including here. And we've got the money together this week for them all. I think, think it's going to line up. I said, God, if you'll keep blessing me, making it happen, I'll try to get on the plane and go or come over to Arlington, whatever you ask me to do. You have one life to live. You don't want to come to the end of that life and have some regret to say, oh, why didn't I do more with that life? Could have done more. We all could do more, sure. But to be able to look back and just say, God, I did the best I could. Someday he will say, well done. It's come to the place in my life, those are the only two words that matter. People give me stuff at the end of a crusade, or last week I was in Philippine, did the weekend, they hand you a Filipino barong, they give you a little plaque or a little sheet of paper, thank you, Pastor Dan. I don't need any of that. don't need any picture in the union paper, I just want two words someday. Well done. Well done. It's all that matters to me now. Well, when I preach about this in college and high schools, I've been preaching impact players for a long time. Maybe someone says, I'm too young. I, <laughs> what am I going to do? You know? Jeremiah said to God when God called him, I'm too young. And God said, don't you, <laughs> don't you ever say you are too young. When I call you, you are not too young. I will make you a city. I will make you a steel wall. I will put my words in your mouth. Don't you say, I am too young. 
You can do something for God. There was a kid named Tim. He was on a mission trip in Africa. I'm not sure what country. Down to the last day, he's getting onto the bus. He's going up a step. And a kid looked up at him and he said, Mr., could you, could I have your shirt? <laughs> he's only got the one shirt, too. If he gives that shirt, then he won't have a shirt. He's got to work all day and fly home still. So he, he said, I didn't give the shirt. He got back to America. All they could think about at night was that kid with no shirt. <clears throat> Began to ask around and try to collect shirts from people and stores. Finally collected 10,000 shirts. Someone heard about it, helped finance a container, and shipped over 10,000 shirts. He's 17 years old. Don't say I'm too young. Ah, you can do things. It's amazing what some young people do. Sometimes, I'll tell this story quickly, Hezekiah, they're 25 years old. And God told him to have a revival, you've got to get rid of all these idols so that God could come in and do something new. This has got to go. So they began to destroy all the idols and what they call the high places. And then God told him to get rid of the bronze snake. God told them to make the bronze snake. And uh, people were dying from snake bites, and uh, they said, put the snake up on a pole like the cross of Jesus. If you get bit, you can look up, and you will be saved. God will give you life. So that's been a great story and a, a relic that was important to them. They've been carrying it with them for 700 years all over Israel. But now it's an idol. Now people are coming, and they're burning incense to it. They're worshiping it, and God said, it's time for that to go. You can guess there are some people, they said, no, 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 God told us to have that. You young man, you, can, you have no right to do that, young man. But God wanted him to do that. That was God's will. Sometimes good snakes, I've heard the sermon, good snakes become bad snakes. Sometimes it was good then, but it's not good anymore. It's got to go. It's in the way. And you have to make some changes with the times. Young man, 25. Well, some people may say, or not enough of us, the need is too big, the challenges are too great, there's too few of us to get much done. I don't know if you remember this story. This is Ceausescu. He was the uh, dictator, communist dictator of Romania. This is what they call the Velvet Revolution. We got to go to some of the museums about it this last year over there. So a young pastor had become pastor of a church named Laszlo Tokas. He's 25 years old. They gave him this huge cathedral that could seat thousands of people, had 25 people. Started to preach the gospel, began to preach freedom, and began to even speak against the government. Filled up the church, people began to come. So he said, they're going to come get me. They don't like what we're saying. He said, don't use any violence, just come and be a witness so the government knows that you are watching and you see. Don't let them do something in the dark. So one day, sure enough, the police were coming, and so the people made a ring around the church trying to protect their pastor. It's December, it's freezing cold, the train brought people home from work, and they saw what was happening, and they stayed. And they gathered more and more until the whole square was filled with people, thousands of people. One boy had a candle in his pocket, and he lit the candle. Other people had something, and they began to light candles, thousands of candles. Eventually, there was some, a problem. There was some violence. Yes, there was. But in two weeks, they had killed Ceausescu and his wife, and the country switched from communist to democracy. In the middle of it all, that boy got shot in the leg. He ended up in the hospital, and uh, the pastor went to visit him. He said, I'm sorry, young man. He said, don't worry, don't worry pastor. I got to light the first light. The first candle started it. The power of one. One of my favorite people in the world is William Wilberforce. I don't know if you know this story. It was an interesting uh, picture in some news I saw today, yesterday. They were down in uh, Senegal. Who was down there? Somebody. And they, uh, they went to the place, what they call the point of no return, where the slaves would come out. I have been to the one in Ghana, Elmina Castle. 
They would go, these ships go down to Africa, go into the inter, in, inter, interland, and bring out people who had no idea what was going on, where they were going, what was happening. They don't speak any language. They get in this castle, and then they put them chains, and they put them on a boat, and they bring them over to the west, Caribbean or us. It was a terrible thing. William Wilberforce was a lord in England, and he said, this is wrong. We should not be a part of this. Fought it by himself. Rich man did not have to do this for 50 years. And finally, somewhere in 1870s in Parliament, he's an old man, he's 80 years old, sitting on the front pew. And they finally voted to do away with slavery throughout the whole British Empire. And there was a standing ovation for one man who had fought the battle for 50 years. The power of one man to change the destiny of thousands and thousands, millions of slaves. One man. Maybe I'll tell one more just real quick. There were two Chinese girls who felt like they had uh, found Jesus and wanted to do something for Jesus. They went to the missionary and they said, uh, give us some place, assign us somewhere. We can try to build up the kingdom. No, no, you girls are too young. Go, go to school. No, we'll go to school later. But God has called us to go. Give us some place to go. So they assigned them to this island, kind of a dangerous island. Really hadn't been anybody else there. Said, you girls want to go? Okay, that's your place. So they went. A couple years later, they had a kind of a convention or something, and these girls were back. The missionaries asked the Chinese leaders, is there anybody that's been planting churches that we could, we could interview and let's see how it's going? Well, there's these two girls, I guess. You could talk to them. So they called for the two girls to come. So they came into the hotel lobby. Now they're dressed like little farmer Chinese girls with a cone hat and little like pajama clothes. In this fancy lobby, they walked through. Everyone staring, came up to the hotel room. And they said, uh, you've been planting churches, yes. How many churches have you planted so far? Oh, not very many, sorry. We're just young girls. We don't know what we're doing. Please let us have another, more time, another chance. We'll do better. How many churches have you started? The two girls whispered. <laughs> they said, uh, 30. 13 churches? No, 30. You have planted 30 churches already in two years? Yes, we're sorry. We know we should have done better. Let us have more time. <laughs> How many people in each church? Oh, very few, very small. We're sorry. We're just getting started. We're young girls. We don't know what we're doing. How many people in each church? Oh, they whispered again. <laughs> well, in the smallest ones, um, maybe about 200. In the two biggest churches, there's about 5,000. We're sorry we haven't done better. Let us, let us have more time. <laughs> How did you do this? We're just young girls. We don't know what we're doing. Every morning we would pray, God, tell us what we ought to do. Whatever idea came into our minds from there, we thought that was from God. We went and did that. And then uh, when that was done, we'd come back and pray again. This is what God has done. We wish we'd done better. <laughs> the power of a few consecrated, anointed people to be impact players for God. How do you know what he wants you to do? Well, we often will say, what's your passion? How many kids would come to see me at La Sierra? Pastor Dan, tell me what, to, what God wants me to do, with this or that. They said, I'll do whatever he wants me to do, even if it kills me. I said, is that your picture of God, that God wants to kill you? Send you to some horrible place that you'll hate, do something you hate doing? No. Listen to your passion. What makes your voice rise? You get around Dan Smith, you hear Dan Smith very long, you'll know what I will, what I will talk about and what makes my voice rise and what makes my eyes flash. That's God's will for me. You call me to be this or that, that's not what God has called me to do. Unless you to do it, this is what I'm called to do. What's your passion? What makes you fun? What, make, what do you talk about? But another idea, <coughs> what makes you a little bit mad? What just kind of, you look around and say, that's just wrong. That's got to stop. That should not be doing that. Why is that? Who is allowing this to keep happening? Someone ought to do that. Why isn't that picked up? Why isn't that being dealt with? 
Maybe that's you. When you have a little passion about something. Bill Hybels wrote a book about it called Holy Discontent. Moses saw that uh, Egyptian killing an Israeli, and he said, that's not right. That's not right. Holy discontent. Got off his horse and killed the man. <laughs> Sorry about that part of it, but the holy discontent. When you see something that's not right. They flew me back to Chicago to preach uh, for a reunion of what they call the 20-something. We, we had a terrible accident when I first got to Chicago. Three guys died in a plane crash. The only son of our head elder, only child, 27 years old. His parents said to me, Pastor Dan, what are you going to do for our son's friends? They need Jesus. They need to be in church. Well, I didn't know what to do. I was going full blast. I said, I don't have any time to add any more ministry. I said, maybe God's calling you. After about five times I said that, they finally did it. They got a couple other couples together, and they started up the 20-something ministry. Huge deal. I won't tell you all the details. Ended up on NAD video, a uh, big deal. Now those people are 50-something, and they're grandparents, and we had a reunion while I was there last year. Many people got married out of that. Big group came to church. They were our praise team. They were our drama team. All from some people got a little mad. Holy discontent. Anyway, uh, please don't misunderstand the next uh, few minutes. These are things that God has put on me. I don't tell you these things to say, boy, look what Pastor Dan has done. Uh, these are what God has got me mad. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, we have to do something. Hoping that will suggest to you where God wants you to be an impact player. And that you'll go home today and say, God, i got so many years left. What can I do for God? So I'm just going to show you some pictures of things. I was just with the president of this college now. He's now just retired, and uh, I did his daughter's wedding. So just 20-some years of being in this family. Girls' dorm, terrible, 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 terrible. Six girls were in a room for two. You had to walk through the door in a special way. There were no desks. There were no chairs. They had to study lying in their bed. There was no drop ceiling. There were no screens on the windows. They were terrible. The bathrooms were the worst. You didn't want to walk in there. It was horrible. I came home. I said to my people at last year, we have to do something. Slowly, slowly, we raised the money, fixed up the girls' dorm. So now two could be in a room, and then it was cleaned up at all. We went over and had a dedication. <laughs> the boys got mad. The boys said to the boys, Dean, how come Pastor Dan always helping the girls, never helping the boys? Oh, brother. <laughs> so, so we had to take on the boys' dorm, long story. But anyway, that got done too. People became my friends for 25 years. We wouldn't help that, that pastor get a motorcycle last week. Last week, true story. I've forgotten that. Three pastors needed motorcycles, and I uh, called a couple of people, and uh, they said, we'll send you the money right now. We went to the motorcycle store and picked out the motorcycle last week, last Monday, uh, a week ago, and we, we took pictures. I pictured three pastors, so happy. Now they can go through the traffic and, uh, for cheap. So there's another motorcycle. When I was there that time, this is years ago, out of 22 pastors in the mission, two had motorcycles, ancient motorcycles. They passed them down 20 years, you know, trying to fix them together. <laughs> the other 20 were standing by the road waiting for public transportation to take them to the next Bible study. It's ridiculous. I came back, got my last year people to do two. I wrote a doctor in Loma Melinda that I had met one time. I said, can you help? Wrote me a check for $14,000, 22 motorcycles. Over time, over time, quiet our God involved. So we're just, we're doing another group now. One mission, we need 35 motorcycles. We're down, I think we have nine to go. So just fun. I was uh, at Norton, uh, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> Mountain View College down in South Philippines. Wonderful place. I'm going this summer for a big youth congress. And they have what they call working students. And I went into their dorm, and here were kids lying on wood, just wood. I said, that's not right. How many do you have like that? 200. I said, how much is it for a mattress? $12 back then. I had a large class at La Sierra. Some of you were probably in it. We, I said, you want to help me get mattresses for these kids? A couple thousand dollars, whatever it was. They could sleep on a mattress. 
Hilda's been with me. We took a group to India. I'll just show this quickly. This is a church. Johnny Thomas is the dean of the School of Business. This is where he grew up. We worked together to build a church. 2,500 seats. Just a wonderful place. Done the whole crusade there. Little hospital. We got off the plane. Hilda was there. All the nursing students, 100 nursing students from all over India, they lined up and we walked between them throwing flowers at us. Have you had that happen to you? How good is this? You talk about bucket list. We're walking down a lift and people are throwing flowers on us, hugging us, beautiful girls. Amazing. The girls' dorm at a high school there, three stories, 31 restrooms, 31 toilets, not a single door still worked. All had broken down. Poor girls. So we had to fix the doors. Couldn't stand it. Second, third floor had no water. The girls had to take a pot, go down to the first floor, fill up their pot, come up to the toilet with no door, and do what they needed to do to get ready to go to school. Lovely, beautiful girls, I thought. I forget, we had to raise 11000 whatever it was. We got fans for those rooms, got those doors fixed. You do what you can. You do what you can to try to make a difference, to make it a little better. Try to help schools. That's one of the powerful ways you can multiply your life. So just trying to be an impact player, trying to get to the pictures of this. We needed computers in the computer lab. So just fun. So we scraped the money together, called a few people. That day, they went to the big city and bought the computers and brought them back. <laughs> fun. Just fun. Fixed the holes. I didn't have any fans. It was 100 degrees in January. Had no fans in the dorms. 20, 30 girls in each of these rooms. So for $25, you can buy a fan. You put a fan on every wall. Do what you can. I had a problem with my ears. So somebody collect wax. So the ENT guy there, he said, can you get this stuff out of my ears? I'm getting ringing. He took it off. He took it out. Gave me some medicine. I said, how much for the medicine? He said, uh, we'll give you the medicine free but we have a couple of projects for you. <laughs> Most expensive ear, ear medicine I've ever had. <laughs> anyway, they had no water, no clean water. Can you imagine? You have a hospital with no clean water. Anyway, we got that done. We got an x-ray machine. We've been helping that little hospital. Now someone has helped them get an ICU. They got a NICU now. Wonderful doctor taking care of that. This family here, uh, the son committed, tried to commit suicide. Hospital saved his life and said, you need Jesus. Your Hindu gods are not cutting it. Jesus has more power than the God that you have. You need to give your life to Jesus. And he took a sledgehammer, and they all had a little ceremony. They prayed, and then they smashed all the Hindu gods. I was there the next week. I went to the house and saw where they had smashed it. They're on the front row of my crusade that night. 2,500 people. Here's this family, Hindu worshipers, a week ago. They found Jesus. Pretty cool. There's the water filter. We've got the new water system. There's the digital x-ray machine. Just trying. There's a doctor, a pediatrician. He's giving his life. He's about the main doctor there. And uh, through COVID, they saved a lot of lives. Great people. What can you do trying to help them out? There's a crusade. Just one mission station here quickly. Uh, Myanmar, high school and college, maybe the worst condition places I've ever been to. This girl's dorm, 25, 30 girls in a room, clothes hanging out all the windows, trying to get these clothes dry. They had 10 squat toilets out behind the dorm. You get up at 5 in the morning and you line up with 25 other girls for your five minutes in that toilet. That's all you got. The, the bathing was a big tank of water, black water. No fence, no place to get away from the boys. Just here you are. You get a sarong. You do the best you can. I couldn't stand it. Came home. I called a couple of people. We at least got 10 more toilets, so they could at least have a little more. What can we do? Try to be an impact player. Just do the best you can. This is a new mission in the Philippines. They couldn't finish the building. We tried to get that done. Whatever you have in front of you, do the best you can. These are four girls. All their fathers work for the ADRA, or uh, one is in Loma Linda now, professor at Loma Linda. Uh, one of the girls, the uh, one on, the, on your right, was our youth pastor at Garden Grove. Pastor in this conference for four years, Sarah May Cologne. She's now the head chaplain at the hospital in, uh, in Hawaii. And those four girls grew up hearing people talk about mission and ADRA and doing something. They finally said, what are we going to do? 
And they finally formed a foundation called Project Propel. And they've been doing stuff in the Philippines. They make urban gardens. They get a sidewalk down by a little village. Maybe hundreds of people behind the wall. You wouldn't even know they're back there. Poor, poor people. And they will clean up this sidewalk. I have helped them dig out the dirt on a sidewalk. Our group. Hardest work I've ever done. And then they put these bottles and plants up on a wall. They get flooded out sometimes. They have to they want to solve that. Now they have some way to float them. <laughs> Pretty cool how they solved all that. Four girls. I can tell you lots of stuff that they're doing in the Philippines. Orphanage. We finished up orphanages in Thailand where I grew up. This is the church. My father was killed. Most of you know that story. Just down the street here, La Sierra Avenue, down back past the Spanish church. My father's walking on the street, got killed. My brothers and I said, what can we do to honor our dad? We didn't have hardly any money, but people gave. Anyway, there's a church at the high school now in honor of our dad. 600 seat church. You do what you can. I was in his... Zimbabwe, our college, university called Seleucy. Great place. Ellen White told them to buy that land, but it's desert land, and they have a hard time. And when I was there doing the week of prayer, the cafeteria was closed, 2,000 students, faculty starving, money's worthless. It's difficult. I came back and got a bunch of people together and said, we have to do something. Anyway, I can tell you lots of stories. But now the farm is there, and the cafeteria is open. The school is doing okay. You do whatever you can do. There's some churches in the Philippines people have helped me do. Anybody know the name Ralph Watts? Used to be the president here in Southern Cal. Was a president in Singapore when I was in high school. He is 90, going to be 90 years old in a few weeks. I had lunch with him this week. He's a great man. Father was in the general conference, and, and he was a great man. Ended up president of ADRA for 17 years. Took it from nothing to a quarter of a billion dollars a year for ADRA. One of the world's best programs Adventist. And since he retired at 67 years old, he has personally raised the money for 40 clinics for women all over Asia. Nepal, Philippines, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. I've been to several of them. I need to be an impact player. He's almost 90 years old. He's on board. He's a chair of Quiet Hour. He's a force. Impact player for God. There's one of the clinics. Some friends of ours live right down the street here last year from Ethiopia. Started a school. His father was killed. And uh, he built a high school now. Just two people down the street here. And they have given their money. They've sacrificed. Just two people. They're not raising much money. They just give it out of what they earn. And now they've got a kid's school with 800 kids in it. Impact player. So John Piper goes around the world saying, don't waste your life. The scripture reading we had today, God says, I created you for my glory. He says, if you don't live for God's glory, you waste your life. When you die, there'll be nothing. Your house won't matter, whatever your car, whatever you got in your bank doesn't matter. Nothing else matters except what you did for the glory of God. What you did that will last, outlast your time. People will be in heaven with you someday. Families you raised, whatever, whatever you did for God's glory glory. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. What are you doing for that, with the one life that you have? Well, let me finish this up. I've had a lot of fun. You can look at me and see just an old man, but I wasn't always old. I have done some fun things. I have whitewater rafted lots of places, lots of fun. And I could water ski. I don't know if I could do it today, but if I had a boat, I think I could. But I have water skied and snow skied and done all, gone all over the world. I've been to Taj Mahal a bunch of times. I'm very thankful. I've lived an anointed life. And most of that has come because I have had uh, a chance to go and do what I could to do something for God. This is Halong Bay in Vietnam, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Got to go now several times. I try not to go to Vietnam without going to Halong Bay. This is Victoria Falls in uh, Africa close to our college there. I've had a lot of fun. I have eaten meals. I've been with good people all over the world. But I want to stand here and say to you, I get more pleasure and more fulfillment and more meaning in my life for those things that I do trying to be an impact player for God than all the rest of it. 
I enjoy the rest of it. I'm thankful for it. But those times when you know that God has used you to do something, doesn't mean the whole world knows about it, doesn't mean you get a lot of trumpets, I get some public because of what I do. But you may be an impact player for God in a very quiet way, but the sheer pleasure, the whole, once I got a taste of that, I can't live without it anymore. The deep pleasure when someone comes up to you and says, you, you baptized me, and now they're a worker for God, you know. I've got people like that, right? I baptized them young, and now, now they're doing a crusade with me. I said, I, I did. <laughs> yeah, you were the one, Pastor Dan. It's a deep, deep pleasure. This is the crusade we had in uh, September, the first crusade in person in the Philippines. Now we're going to bring the same revelation to you, if you'll accept it. This is not a traditional every word. Please don't, <laughs> don't expect coming, expect that I'm going to go down verse by verse and we're going to look at what happened in the 400, 500 BC, A.D. I'm not talking about the tribes coming down to sack Rome. That, that's not the focus of this. This is the character of God in the book of Revelation. And, and I, I put it out there and I said, I hope you guys will like it. I went through the union office, at the union office down there, and every one of the union people said, we like this character of God message from Revelation. I'd, it'll be my third time through it. I was fine-tuning. I hope you'll like it. Um, may God bless it. Amen. That's what we're going to try to do. I, I probably showed you these pictures last time. There's a thousand people we baptized in the ocean here in the middle of October. Unbelievable experience. I'm very thankful. I'm very blessed. This pastor that I was with last week, I did the wedding for uh, his daughter last Sunday. We have so many memories together. He was the president of that small school. We baptized 300 in a place called Lagaspi, the capital city, going there into March again. And at the end of the thing, we baptized three, 400 people in a swimming pool in the afternoon. And I said to the mission and a few other people, I said, if we don't find a way to get these kids into the Adventist school. We will lose them. They're young kids, some of them so small, you had to hold them in the pool because their feet didn't go to the bottom. I said, they're going to go back home to their home. They're the only Adventist. They don't know where the Adventist church is. We're going to lose them. The best I could do was find 10 kids, 10 scholarships. That's all I found. I came back a year later to do the graduation on Sunday morning. Flew in early, 7 in the morning. We had breakfast. I'm on my way to get my robe on to do the sermon for the commencement. And a girl cries out. She says, Pastor Dan. <laughs> yes. I said, uh, you remember me? Why, why do people ask that? You know, can't you see how old I am? You know, oh, come on. So out of 300 people, they asked me to remember a year later. I said, no, sorry. You baptized me, Pastor Dan. I was the one. Are you sure? Well, I'm the only white man at 15 pastors. Yes, okay. They, they, she remembered me. I said, no regret, no regret, Pastor Dan. I said, I'm the only Adventist in my family. But I got one of your scholarships to go to Naga View College. You get that? Yes, it's fun to go to Disneyland, and yes, it's fun when the Lakers win a championship, and it's fun to go to Taj Mahal. Yes, it is. But there was no pleasure I have found equal to that. When someone comes to God and comes and says, thank you, thank you, I'm here because of you. Thank you very much. I'll finish with this. We were doing a crusade. This is around 2000, give or take. I was just kind of getting going with this, starting to remodel churches. I didn't didn't know God had given me any gift for this, but seemed to be showing up. I'm in my hotel room working on the sermon for that night. The union president became the division president, passed away now. He came to my door and said, we want to show you something. He didn't really have time to do this, but okay, okay. Took me down a road, dirt, crummy road, and here was this. Here was this uh, few little blocks, some gravel, some sand, and weeds, just weeds everywhere. He said, we want to have a school. We're a new mission. We have no, no school. The kids have to go to public school or they go to a Catholic school. We need a school, Pastor Dan. Two stories. How much? It always gets me in trouble. 
They know they got you when you ask how much. <laughs> how much? $20,000 back then. That was, seemed like a lot of money to me. <laughs> I said, how much for the first floor? <laughs> 12000 I said, okay, I'll try that. But I said, you have to give the first 1000 Okay. School board has to give 1000 Okay. I came home, made some calls. Anyway, I got the 12000 pretty quickly. I said, okay, God, if you're going to help me that good, I'll try to go for the twenty. So I made a few more calls anyway. Raised the 20000 sent it over there. I am pastor of a big church. I got plenty to do with that church. I don't need to be solving problems for the Philippines. I said, enough. Okay, let me focus on my church. A few months later, I got an email. Pastor Dan, we're sorry. Prices went up. We're not done. We need 6000 more dollars. Line after line of stuff they needed. And I just lost it. I just lost it. I'm sorry. I wish I was more mature. <laughs> I said to God, find someone else. I am too small for this. I'm pastoring a church. I don't need to solve every problem around the world. I don't know people with this much money. Just find someone bigger than me to do this. Done. I drove over to Loma Linda, slipped into a restaurant there. I was, having a I was in a small group with some guys there. And a guy there who was a good guy, he's on the La Sierra University board now. He started that bank downtown. He had a check for $1,000. He said, can you, can you use this check? <laughs> I looked up at God in my heart and said, God, does this mean I don't get to quit? You know, you're going to keep giving me money. By that night, I had the $6,000. Sent it over there. On another trip, I said, I'll come down and help dedicate the school. On a Sunday, I flew down. And all 60 kids were there and all the teachers and all the mission people on Sunday. And uh, do I should be there. Where's the picture? There it is. School was nothing the year before. Now the school. Ten years later, in between uh, last year and going to Garden Grove, I had a I had a, a week of prayer at the college on the other end of the island, a few hundred miles away. At lunchtime, I'm in the cafeteria, and ten kids came and gathered around me. I'm just sitting there eating. Are you Pastor Dan? <laughs> they know who I am. Yes, I'm Pastor Dan. We are, we are from the school that you built in Domaguete City. We are the first class that graduated from that school. There's a high school there now, too. If you hadn't built that school, we wouldn't have had any chance to go to Adventist school. We just want to come here and say thank you for building that school. And we want to sing you a song. And I sat there at that table and listened as 10 kids who had a chance for Advent education. Now they're halfway through college because we did a little something. I don't put all the money. I put $100, $200 in. I find people. I'm the middleman. I find people to help me do it. I get to go there, and they sang a song to me. So I will say to you, I think being an impact player for God is the best there is. Amen. I have not found anything that matches the depth and purity of the pleasure I get in doing that, knowing that you're doing it for God, knowing that God is blessing you, knowing that you're doing whatever God has asked you to do. This is my story. Please, I'm not trying to make a deal out of that. I'm hoping you will get inspired to be an impact player for God. Amen. He will take the one life that you have and do something for God. Amen? Amen. We got a crusade coming. Uh, I, 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 I'm not expecting, you know, a thousand baptisms in the ocean. But uh, whoever God puts on your heart, if there are some people in your life that you buy groceries from or down the street or you're related to people in your family, this is a chance to say, Pastor Dan's going to do revelation. But it will not be revelation that will scare you, all right? This will not scare anybody. This is a character of God, and God is a good. God has got all the good all the time. That's what this will be. I don't believe in scaring people to Jesus. And so I think this is something you can invite people to safely. It's one of my favorite compliments when people come to my crusade. Pastor Dan, the first time we left without being scared. God is a God of grace and mercy. I'm going to preach that. 
Invite your friends to come. I hope that you will come. You will learn something yourself. People think, you know, that it's just for the public people. No, it's for you too. Please come. And uh, if there's something that you hear that doesn't sound quite right and we talk afterward, don't wait till the end of the week to tell me you didn't like something. Tell me right there that night so I can fix it the next night if I make it wrong. We want to get it right. I want to preach the truth that will get it right to glorify God. And if there's a few people that will be baptized at the end, thank you very much. We want to win who God has made hungry. We want to win who God has assigned to the Arlington Church for that week. Is that all right? Take some literature. Do whatever you can do. Uh, be an impact player for God. Don't be satisfied to just be in a pew. Be an impact player for God. Amen, amen. You want to stand up and say, yes, Pastor Dan, I want to be an impact player for God. Would you stand where you are and say, yeah, I want to, I want to do it. All right. Thank you. Let's pray. Under Father in heaven, I thank you for being our God. And that you could do all this yourself. You could have angels do it. But somehow you have said, I want to call you. I will put my word in your mouth. I will bless you if you'll just let me speak to you, whisper to you. I thank you for the things that I've had a small part in doing. I pray for this pastor, pastoral staff, for the leaders of this church, for everybody here who are standing before you and say, we want to be an impact player. Bless them. Bless them. Not going to be what I do. They do what you call them to do. But they will find a great deep pleasure knowing that they are doing something with you. Guided by your spirit, know that they are anointed and give all the glory to you. And maybe we'll get to heaven and come inside the gates and there will be people that we will spend a thousand years and eternity with because of this week at the end of February. May it be so, Father. Bless this church. Bless each one here, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.